going to pick up where we left off in this lecture. It's not that long, actually. It's only another maybe half hour at the most here going on. Um, so what it, uh, I just wanted to say a few things about introspection here. It's a concept. It's not really a feature of the language. It's just a description of how to assess certain qualities of objects. And one of the things we're looking at is how to use this ID appropriately. If you're going to use ID as a generic object type, eventually you're going to want to see well, what kind of object is that if you make every because you can essentially make everything an id in the language if you do that you can put all your objects together why would you want to do that because you have collections of objects that you want to manipulate you want to move around or use for certain things and uh, eventually you're going to want to try and figure out what they are or what you can do with them and so that's why these methods this all the objects here that are inherited from ns object come with these three methods in them and the methods are essentially going to give us these properties that we're looking at. And the property is going to be like, is kind of a, is this particular object a kind of a particular class? Or is it a member of the class or something of that nature? So it's really so that we can make things generic and then identify things and apply the appropriate methods for something. So it's not really that big of a thing. It's just a way of describing that type of behavior. They call it introspection. So here's a method testing technique. Uh, used for the selector, S-E-L, selector. So selector is actually a special, so at selector, it's a special compiler directive, and it turns the name of the method into a selector. So as an example here, does it respond to a particular method? And the method we're going to ask about is shoot. Remember from the example before, there were some ships, and there was a shoot, and there was a move method. And we have this generic ID for this object and this object type. We're going to send a message to it, and the message we're going to send to it is going to be respond to selector at selector. Well, turn shoot into a selector, which means it makes it into a method. You say, well, does it respond to this method? If it does respond to the method, then it must be of the object type ship because it responds to the method correctly. Or if not, it's of a compatible method that has a, excuse me, shoot. Yeah. Uh, or is a compatible object that has a shoot method associated with it. All right, so we have this if and then we'll test, and we have this else if kind of, you know, the, otherwise does it respond to shoot at or does it respond to move or something. And then we can actually, w the reason why we do this is so we, we can prevent runtime errors because we're not going to get any compiler error. Um, and we're not going to get, you know, we might get a warning if we're lucky. Most likely what we're going to get are runtime errors and you know, these fatal things that just bomb out completely. So we could put these little checks in there to prevent the runtime error, which is kind of odd thinking if you think about it. Other languages don't work this way. But um, Objective-C allows you to do a lot of troubleshooting at runtime, more troubleshooting than most people would actually do. Uh, it's because a lot of things happen at runtime that aren't checked at compile time. So, so the selector here is the Objective-C type for a selector, so it's SCL, so selector, capital SCL here. Shoot selector, shoot at selector, move to selector, it's going to be equal to, and we're going to create a selector, selector from shoot, shoot at, and these are the method names. So, nothing like this on the exam, but I just thought I'd point this out to you so, since we covered the introspection lecture, this was part of what we were looking at. And the reason why we went through the introspection activity was to kind of show you the generic nature. So if you remember that tutorial, we just put a bunch of labels and a bunch of buttons, six buttons, six labels, two or three views out there. And then we just programmatically looked at all the objects on the canvas and said, well, are you, are you on the, are you in the window? If you're in the window, <laughs> you're here. If you're a label, then change your text font to blue or something, or change your background color to something. Um, and so it was kind of an easy way to kind of apply the concept. How are you going to apply it in the real world? Who knows? Maybe if you have a property where the user selects they want the background color of all their screens to be blue or something. You can do a little check on all the GUI components. There are subclasses of view and then change all the background colors to blue or something if you wanted to. So here's your foundation framework. So remember I said there's a question on the exam about foundation framework. What is it? Well, it's a framework that holds all of the NS objects, actually. NS object here is the base class. Pretty much everything in the iOS. Uh, implements introspective methods. Um, actually, NS object has a lot of built-in built functionality to it, more so than most other object-oriented programming languages. Not more. I mean, Java's got, 
Well, Java's particular. Java's got the two-string method that's part of it. It's got a bunch of other, but not as many. And C++ has really nothing. There's nothing on object. Object to C is all about the object. So there's so much built-in functionality for it. So it implements the introspection methods as well. So we've got the anything NS stands for next step. It's all part of the foundation framework. And uh, NS string is an example. Um, with NS log, another example. So we have generic type ID for copy, ID mutable copy. So all objects implemented this particular mechanism. Raise is an exception if not implemented, actually. So part of the foundation network is in a string. So it's a string type. It's an international, um, any language string used for Unicode. Actually, there's some various different variations of it. You can actually extend it, inherit from it. Um, so used throughout the iOS instead of the C language character star. Um, so the compiler will create an NS string for you by using uh, this syntax here, as we've seen before. And this is really just another review, kind of, of the concept. This app directive tells the compiler to make a string out of this string, really. But it doesn't know that this is a string. It's just going to take whatever's in between the quotes and make a string out of it. So you can put numbers in there and turn it into a string. So, uh, and a string instance cannot be modified. And so they are immutable. And if strings are not modifiable. So what does that mean? When you create a string, you put a string out there. You can change the string. That's fine. The string that was out there stays out there. You get a new string. <laughs> new memory location. New string. So if I have and a string, first name. One line of code says first name is equal to Bob. Next line of code, first name is equal to Larry. First name is equal to Mo. Those are three different strings. Actually, I should have said Larry Curley and Mo for the three students. Anyway, those are three different strings. They're immutable. They're not changing the original string. So you can have a mutable object where it takes Larry and changes Larry into Mo, changes Mo into Curly. All three values are stored at the same memory location for the same, same string value. What do we care about? Mutable, immutable. Immutable takes up more memory. <laughs> mutable. Less memory, more memory conservative. It doesn't really matter. Nah, depends on what we're doing with it. So, <clears throat> we don't, I can't really think of any reason why an immutable string would cause a problem in any language, really. So, um, and a string instance cannot be modified. Usual usage pattern is to send a message to an NS string that will return a new one, new string. So, self.display.txt is equal to, well, String by appending string digit. So there's a ton of these string, ton of these string class methods. This is not a class method. This is a class method. The dead giveaway to figure out whether something is a class or an instance method is what are we running it on? If we're running it on n string and n string is a class, we know it's a class method. If we're running it on an instance of an object, we know it's an instance method. That's pretty easy. You don't really need to know that for the final, but in the future when you look at that. It's nice to know sometimes the difference only because then you know what you're doing. Sometimes if you're looking at somebody else's code and you're going, well, what is that? It's a class method. It's, and what are we doing here? We're this is a property that we're changing. Self is ourselves. It's really some label probably or some text field or something labeled display. And we're setting the dot text. That's legal. We're setting a property of the text that's part of that object display. That display object is probably a UI label or a UI text field or something like that, is what I'm thinking. Uh, so tons of utility functions available, case, sensitive, case conversions, URL, sub, substrings, type conversions, all sorts of different things. So let's compare that one with the MS mutable string. There's a mutable form of all of these guys, by the way, or most of them, 99.9% .9 of them. Mutable version of a string, somewhat rarely used. Why is it rarely used? It's the same thing I was saying before. Do we really care? We're just going to replace the string with another string. Do we really want to change the string? So you can do uh, the same things you do as in a string can do without creating a new one. It's an in-place changes. So if it, this is actually, actually, this is a pretty good way of putting it. In place changing versus new memory address changing. Does it make a difference? 
You know, if I were working on a very small footprint and I had a ton of strings, it might make a difference. I could do in place changes without having to take up more memory and wait for the garbage collector to come in. It's almost like, you know, if you only need one, you're going to use one, you can just reuse it. It doesn't, it doesn't take any much more time to use a mutable string, but the question is why? Why? I mean, there's, there's no reason to really. But if I had a thousand of these little strings, It'd be easier just to use one memory location and just keep changing it. <laughs> For iPhone apps and all that stuff, we can, since for the memory, saving memory, we can use immutable. You can, you know, hardly anyone uses it, but you can use it. Well, the thing is, as soon as you run out of memory, um, the garbage collector comes and picks it up. And you're going to change string a hundred times. You're going to make a thousand strings, and you're just going to replace the value over and over and over again. It's the same reference. Eventually, you're going to fill up your memory, and then it's going to go through all the ones you're not using anymore and get rid of them. <laughs> it's going to replace them eventually anyway. So, I mean, biggest thing is, you know, why do it then? So there, it's just, you know, there's some people that are conservative, you know, that will do some things a certain way, but some people, they won't. I don't know. It's hardly used. Well, it's like a number, and it's number. What I'm doing is I'm giving you a summary of the foundation framework. So if I were to ask you a question on the final exam saying, what are some of the components of the foundation framework? Here you go. We got NS string, NS mutable string. We got anything with an NS next to it as part of the framework, by the way. Um, NS number. It's another thing here. So it's an object object wrapper. As I mentioned before, we have primitives and then we have numbers. Or, excuse me, objects. Not, we have primitive data types. Integer, here's some integers. Integer, float, double, boolean. These are primitive data types. They're built into the language. They're used like data types in any other language. And then we have wrapper objects. That's your NS number, your NS data, your NS date, your NS anything that's an object version of the primitive. And there's one for every one of the primitives. Why do we want object wrappers? Well, they come in handy for certain things. We can treat them like objects now. Put them together with other objects and use them all together rather than using them as variables. So it does come in handy for certain things. And this number is going to be an NS number, number with integer with in it. Well, this is interesting. So you're going to create this, this, call, this line of code here creates a number. And the number is going to be with an integer 36. And it's going to be assigned to a variable called num that's of type NS number. People look at that and go, why in the world do that? You just go integer num equals 36. <laughs> Your lines of code. Well, that's the primitive. The integer number is equal to that's the primitive variation of this type here. This one here is the, the longer object version of it. So bigger question is why you want to do that. You know, you're going to use number with something else. Number could also be an ID eventually, too. It's generic. So Depends on whether you're going to do something object oriented with it. But this is also another example of another class method. Number with integer is a class method run on number, NS number. And this is a parameter, the colon 36, takes parameters 36. So float f is equal to number float value. Well, that's this number up here. So the float value is a method that's a instance method that's being run on this instance of number, which is an NS number. And it's going to be equal to float. We've mixed and matched. That's primitive. That's an object. So float value gives us our primitive versions of the objects. Well, return 36 is a float. We'll convert the types automatically for you. Useful when you want to put these primitive types into a collection, NS array, NS dictionary. So some of the collections require primitive data types instead of object types, and some of the collections will take object types. So it depends on what collection you're working with. Take the data structures class, you'll get more familiar with collections framework and the collections themselves. NS value, generic object wrapper for other non-object data types, like CG point as an example. is a good one. So NS data. Bag of bits, just raw data, raw data. Used to save, store, transmit data through the iOS. Well, what's, what's going to be raw data? Uh, a dump from a URL or something, or a message you're going to send over or something. 
And this date comes in a couple of different varieties. We also have an NS calendar, NS date formatter, NS date components. We did a date with a time and the date. Um, and you'll see that, in fact, you probably could probably remember from that tutorial that we did for the digital clock. And we did a date thing in the right in the beginning where you can pull out the hours and minutes and the seconds by doing a little calculation and putting them into labels and stuff. It's all separated out into subcomponents, so it's fairly easy to work with. Here's an NS array. Some people worked with this um, when they worked with the, the ships in their assignment. Ordered collection of objects. It's immutable. It doesn't change. But there's an NS mutable array, <laughs> so we can have one. Probably on the, yeah, it is on the next slide <laughs> that we can use to uh, um, make a change. So that's right, once you create an array, you cannot add or remove objects to the array unless you use this one here. So this one here has got the count, object at index, last object. The way you really get to know some of these data types is to use them, actually. Use them in a program and you'll figure it out. So MS mutable array works with the uh, the version here with an array with capacity, another array, an add object, an insert object. NS dictionary, another concept to be familiar with. It's another form of the, uh, and then there's an NS mutable dictionary. Each one of these has a mutable, by the way. Dictionary is more of a key value lookup set. It's kind of a, you know, it's a nice little way of getting uh, two pieces of information stored together as a lookup table. It's faster for looking out. So terms of the uh, key and value sets. So. And then there's the set, NS set. And you notice that some of these here have, uh, for example, here is a class method. And then most of them have um, instance methods associated with them. Class methods are normally associated with getting, um, setting the object itself. Like here's a dictionary, create an empty dictionary. So you don't alloc an init because the, the method Dictionary creates a new dictionary. So it's going to give you a new one that's already set up for you versus an item that you've made yourself that you're going to alloc and in it when you create it. So the syntax is slightly different because the functionality is separated out. And uh, you might actually consider these, like for example, here in the set, set with object, set with array, that these might almost be considered constructors from a certain perspective. And they actually kind of sort of are, but they're not called constructors. But they're used just like constructors. And they would be. So here's our NS set and our NS mutable, mutable set. Our NS ordered set and our NS mutable ordered set. I'm not going to go through these. This is kind of boring. But um, these are all different data types that you can use. And then they're actually kind of data structures, actually, for the most part. Enumerations are also supported in the language, looping through members of a collection in an efficient way to enumerate. So it's a for-in kind of looping mechanism. You don't really need to know this for the final either. Uh, it's stuff that we didn't actually cover in any of the tutorials. We didn't do a we didn't do a dictionary, which we probably should do, and we didn't really do any enumerating. Uh, but we could probably do that. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy. We did look at property lists, though. Pretty sure we did, and if we didn't, maybe we could do that if you wanted to do that. So I'll take a vote again, and then when I get done with this lecture, see what you guys want to do. But a uh, term property list means that it's a collection of data, so it's a collection of collections. So you could put numbers, strings, dates, all sorts of items into a property list. You store the property list. It's kind of like a text file, actually. You store it in the in the directory that gets installed if you're doing an iOS app. And you're reading and writing to it <coughs> and using it sort of like a text file, but it's really a dictionary or a key set, key value set. So you have first name with a text name and maybe an array of addresses or something or telephone numbers. The one that we do, the property list example that we could do, or we if we haven't done it already in this class, is um, the one where it st stores the user's name, address, telephone number, creates a P list, and then, which just stands for property list, stores it all the information and it reads and writes to the property list from the GUI. Not really that. Uh, it's not really that difficult, actually. Other foundation information and as user defaults, lightweight storage for property lists. If you wanted to set properties or 
Well, the property list actually came out of the concept of setting properties initially. You wonder properties. Well, <coughs> user um, installs an app. The property might be what's the user's first name and last name, and when did they install the app or something. It's information that's helpful, sort of like cookie files, actually, in the old days. Information that's helpful for navigating through the app, through the program, perhaps. So. All right, that was actually the end of this lecture. So as I was telling you, it wasn't really that much left to this. <laughs> we just had a little bit of it to finish up. It's not a bad review, although it's very um, high-level summary in terms of some of the concepts. But it, it's a nice little review of some of the important um, concepts that are associated with it. So I'm going to stop this video because it concludes this lecture.